The Texas Parks and Wildlife Television Series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places. Coming up on Texas Parks and Wildlife. The hunt test takes elements of duck hunting to see the skills that are necessary to be a successful hunting dog. Thank you. They're the second smallest bat in North America, and we call them the chicken nuggets of the cave because a full-grown <laughs> adult, they are about the size of chicken nuggets. You want to have those fish there for them to catch because that's what's going to get them hooked. Oh, 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 back up, back up, back up. Texas Parks and Wildlife, a television series for all outdoors. It's Friday afternoon in the Houston Medical Center, and Ruby Rubin is just heading into work. Good girl. No, that's not Ruby. That's Ruby. She starts her shift by greeting her co-workers. How are you doing today? She puts on her <laughs> ID bag. And before long, she's out making the rounds. Hello. This is Ruby. Yes, Hi, Ruby. <laughs> Ruby's seven years old. She's a Labrador retriever. She's here to lift the spirits of patients on a job which might include a game of fetch. Hey, you go. It's a treat for patients and work for Ruby, but it's a job she loves. Good to see you again. Ruby. This work requires her to be obedient and disciplined, qualities that she learned from her handler, Dorothy Ruman. I got into dogs because a two-year-old chocolate Labrador came with the package when I got married. We'd go hunting a lot, and every time I'd shoot a bird, his dog would take my bird to him. And I didn't like that, so I wanted my own dog to bring my own bird to me. And so I purchased my own puppy and came home and trained her and had my first gun dog. The hunting season is so short, I decided I wanted to do competitions with them. Dorothy trained two other competition dogs before adopting a very special black lab named Cole. Cole was my soulmate. She gave me a platform and she gave me a name in our sport. Ruby was her little sister and she raised Ruby and Ruby worshiped her. It was Cole who first taught Ruby what being a champion is all about. We have these great dogs, they're wonderful gifts, and we enjoy taking them out and, and using them for what they're bred to do. Fetch. Good girl, very good. So in your own house you have an obstacle course heel. Very nice, good. Drop. That's it right there. Ruby Long. trains in the field most weekends. Ruby. And practices those skills at home. That's it. Very good. Ruby. So who says you can't train in a subdivision? <laughs> Ruby. It's a talent nice. that runs in the family. Dixie. Ruby's little sister, Dixie, is Sit. just learning Ruby. the basics. Sit. Sit. Here. Heel. Sit. Sit, whoops, I dropped one. Leave it. They have to sit for hours and they can't move. And that icy water when you're duck hunting, that's the beginning and the foundation of all of her training right there. The dog's training will be pushed to the limits at the Master National Retriever Competition being held this year at the Big Woods on the Trinity, also known as Doc McFarlane's Place. What a hunt test does is it takes elements of duck hunting and takes it to a schematized level. We can design technical ponds to see the skills that are necessary to be a successful hunting dog in a sort of a compact and shorter time frame. Over 800 dogs compete here from all over the nation. These dogs are the elite of the sport, having qualified at other regional hunt tests. But the whole event has a spirit of encouragement and good nature. Because the dogs don't compete against each other, 
They compete against a standard. It's a pass-fail test in a series of increasing difficulty over eight days with one goal. Always bring back the bird. Now it's Ruby's turn. She watches closely as the marks are set. When she has her eye on the right mark, Dorothy gives her the cue. It's a clean retrieve. Next, they aim for the live flyer. Ruby heads for the spot just where the bird came down, but there's a problem. The bird is not there. Dorothy gives the signal to start searching, boxing the area until Ruby picks up the scent. She still hasn't found the bird. Dorothy is worried. Where is this silly thing? Ruby is getting tired and starting to overheat in the afternoon Texas sun. If Ruby returns without a bird, it's all over. I just boxed that whole area. I just don't know where it is. This flyer has turned into a runner, and a simple retrieve is now a game of hide and seek. I can give her one more back and try one more time. It moved. Well. Ruby finds the flyer, but she's exhausted and overheating. The judges give her a break to cool off. After a short rest and some water, Ruby goes for it and brings back the last two birds clean. It's a successful run, but it's taken a physical toll on Ruby. She got hot. Immediately, the judges said, put this dog in an air-conditioned vehicle and get her off the grounds. And so we came straight back, and she spent the whole afternoon on the bed. But this isn't the first time Ruby has felt a little down. For several months, uh, Ruby used to have dreams and she used to cry. I knew she was mourning for Cole. We lost her to hemangiosarcoma, and it's a cancer that, um, that sets on very quickly. We had 10 and a half years with her, and that was a blessing. She was a once in a lifetime dog. After Cole died, a big hole was in our heart. We ran the week after with Ruby, and it was so amazing. She turned on. She ran a perfect series. It was like Ruby was running for Cole. She was always the sidekick. Now she was top dog, and she could shine to her fullest, and she did. After a good night's sleep, Ruby is back in the field to show off what she can do. Heel, that's it. Close. That's it. Ruby. <laughs> It's a flawless run that helps her secure yet another Master National title. But all the honors, awards, and trophies are no replacement for a quiet morning with the family and a real duck hunt. There are no judges or spectators here. here. Right here. Here. Hunting to us is a fun time to get out with the family, and we just get to put our hair down and just relax. As a trainer, I ask a lot of all of our dogs. This is kind of our reward because she's paid her dues. Let them run, let them do what they're bred to do. There they are. Go. The go. dogs love it because it's a new experience every time you go out. Ruby.
It feels great to get a few ducks, and that's icing on the cake. The family snags a few birds for dinner and heads home. Nice hunt. Yeah. Fun. Fun hunt. It's just another day on the job for Ruby the she Retriever. Did. She had a very fun time. Hi, I'm Heidi Rayo, Hunter Education Specialist with Texas Parks and Wildlife. Let's talk about safe zones of fire while hunting. When hunting in a group, each hunter has a safe zone of fire. This is an area where you can safely take a shot. If you shoot beyond your safe zone of fire, this could have dangerous or deadly results. It's easy to find your safe zone of fire. Start by focusing on an object ahead of you like a tree. Hold your thumbs up and slowly bring them to the side of your body until your thumbs disappear out of vision. This is about a 45 degree angle and the area where you can safely take a shot. This is your safe zone of fire. It's that easy. If you're hunting with another person, be very careful to never cross into that person's safe zone of fire. In fact, no matter how many hunters there are, even one hunter, you should never swing outside of your 45 degree safe zone of fire. Another thing to think about is target fixation. When a bird flushes, you can easily forget about your surroundings and your safe zone of fire. If you're excited and only focusing on your target, you can quickly lose track of your safe shooting zone. You can even lose sight of buildings and roadways. This is very dangerous. Bottom line, don't let target fixation override your sense of safety. Firearm safety is your responsibility. So always be aware of your safe zone of fire, even when you're excited. We always want to enjoy safe and memorable hunts. There is a shift going on in Texas. More and more people are moving from the country to the big cities and sprawling suburbs. And many of those folks don't have a place to get away, a place to go fishing. But there is a program underway to change that. Make it easy, convenient, and close to home. It's the Neighborhood Fishing Program. I'm almost getting a bite. And now city lakes throughout the state are stocked year round. You want to have those fish there for them to catch because that's what's going to get them hooked. Our goal with the Neighborhood Fishing Program is to bring the focus back to the outdoors. The plan is to get more city folks grabbing the pole again and heading for the pond. I think they'll be coming momentarily because they said between 9 and 9.30. Effie Dukes and her husband David are waiting. Yeah, look, they're coming with the fish. Some of them are going in maybe at 14 inches and they're pretty healthy. The hatchery does a great job of getting ready. Now we'll catch something. Another one here. We'll catch the big one. What we try to do is to actually uh, bring fishing close to home. And most people in Texas are moving into bigger and bigger towns. Right. Having these opportunities in your backyard basically is what it's all about. Yeah, got a big one. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. <laughs> While Effie's husband has the touch, her goal is to stay slime free. I use gloves to put the worms on. I don't want to touch them, they're squirrely. <laughs> I have wet wipes. But he said real fisher people don't use wet wipes or plastic gloves. But I told him I'm not a real fisher woman. I'm just, you know, out here to enjoy the outside. Look, Pastor Bird got one already. Yay. You know, the program is designed to actually kind of recruit new anglers and get people fishing. 
groups. And it's pretty much, we want to provide a perfect outdoor experience with fishing being the main point. <laughs> and as for Effie, she finally catches that fish and stays clean at the same time. Oh, got it. <laughs> Look, hey, it's a big catfish and I caught it with a net with the help of my husband with the rod and reel that I don't know how to use. <laughs> In South Houston at Tom Bass Pond, the bite is about to get really good. You teach a child to fish, you feed them for a lifetime, all right? While this truck will bring trout in the winter, it's summer and there's catfish aplenty. Okay, let's learn how to put our own bait on. Who wants to put their own bait on? There you go, go in the end. There he is. Push it on. Try to push it all the way. Squeeze him, he ain't hurting. <laughs> what is that that's coming out? Worm stuff. Worm stuff. Each child that participates in these types of activities will develop or have the opportunity to develop a lifestyle. That's something that they can go back home with and say, Mama, Daddy, Amy, Grandmother, take me fishing. Swing him to me. Right there. When you're trying to introduce kids to fishing, is he still alive? Yes, he is. They really need to have a good probability they're gonna catch a fish. One little touch. I love you. See? So there's a fishery here pretty much year round that people can count on. First fish of the day. For the opportunity to be nearby is the new key. These children may never see the rainforest, but they can appreciate what is near to them. And that is most important. Oh, you got one. Oh, look at him come out here just in a few minutes. Let go. Come on. I got it. Come on. How'd you do that? That's not fair. When you're out here, it's, it's very relaxing. And then when you can have your kids out here with you, that's so cool. So where do all these fish come from? Well, hatcheries throughout the state raise and stock thousands of catfish and trout every year. Here at Possum Kingdom, the majority of the work goes to raising these hungry catfish. One pond holds up to 6,000. We raise them up all the way up to 12 inches, and it usually takes several months to a year to get them up to size. With the help of city, county, and corporate sponsors, the hatcheries can raise the thousands of fish needed for the program. These are heading for city lakes in Waco and San Angelo. The small bodies of water that we stock in the city, they typically don't have real stable quality fisheries in them. It's pretty much a necessity, this program, if we want to reach out to the urban angler. In the heart of San Angelo, rainbow trout have just been stocked in Oak Street Lake. This spot in particular is real close to downtown. It's close to a lot of residential areas. So as far as you can. This was basically a perfect spot for neighborhood fishing program. Local Charles Cruz. Dad, it looks like it's moving. And his daughter Cameron are here to try their luck. Look, something looks like it's something messing with mine. Sometimes he tries to get me to touch him, I just don't want to. <laughs> I think that's real good for her to be able to experience outdoors like I did when I was younger. Hold on, I think I caught a stick. <laughs> I think this generation, for some reason, is getting away from that. <laughs> I can't get the stick off either. <laughs> and uh, I'd like to do my part. The power bay and the corn looks gross together. <laughs> With the Neighborhood Fishing Program, we're trying to get kids excited about the outdoors again. Get it. Look, someone's getting it. That they will grow up and, and become people that want to protect natural resources. Is it a big one? Medium. Perfect. How do you like? It'll always be our time together. 
even if you don't catch anything, it's just nice to have that little bonding moment that you have with your kids. And I think that right there is worth more than catching any amount of fish. Either for kids. We got another one here. Or for kids at heart. And I've been fishing about 25 years, but this is a lot of fun. I will be back again. No matter the age, there's sure to be a stocked city pond nearby where good times are just a cast away. Golly, that's a huge one. Celebrating a century of Texas state parks. Longhorn Cavern State Park is one of the most unique places in the state of Texas. We are the only publicly accessible cavern in the state of Texas that was largely formed by the work of an underground river. We have literally centuries of Texas-sized stories that took place right here within the park and largely within the cavern itself. I can think of really nowhere else in Texas where you can walk in the footsteps of Civil War era bat guano miners, nuclear fallout shelter survivors, underground dancers, and live entertainment from the 1930s. All of it happening right here in Longhorn Cavern. And you can learn all about it on a cavern walking tour almost every single day of the year. Geologists believe that the rocks that surround this cave are about 500 million years old, but the cave itself is relatively young, just a few million years old, and so we still have a lot of growing left to do here. Watch your head, your tall ones, because it does get low right here for a second. So I'm going to show you one of the bats we have in our cave. They're called tricolor bats. They are the second smallest bat in North America, and we call them the chicken nuggets of the cave because in full-grown adult they are about the size of chicken nuggets. We are one of the best places in Texas to be able to get up close to bats and really admire these interesting creatures at a distance and a, a level of depth that you just don't get other places. There's more to do here than just see the cave. We have over a mile of walking trails, plenty of green space, picnic areas, lots of things to do here. Longhorn Cavern State Park opened uh, Thanksgiving Day of 1932, but in 1934 things really started to change when the Civilian Conservation Corps arrived to begin a formal excavation and development of the park. The CCC removed over 3,000 dump truck loads of debris. The CCC, when they came in to uh, remove the debris, all the work they did was all done by hand. There was no machinery that was actually inside the cave. They removed everything with 50-gallon uh, buckets, 5-gallon buckets, shovels, pickaxes. They used levers up top to pull it out of the sinkholes that we have in the cave. They installed our first lighting systems. They laid down the first trail surfaces. They built Park Road 4 uh, up above ground, and they also built some of the beautiful CCC-era buildings that we have here on the property. There's really a lot for visitors to take in, and the historical significance of what the CCC did here is pretty amazing. Anybody scared to go down there? Uh. Longhorn Cavern offers a more adventurous tour um, called the Wild Cave Tour. You crawl around in the dirt. It's not uncommon to get in the water. You're crawling through uh, tunnels that are very low. Ow! At the Wild Cave Tour, you're crawling on your hands and knees, army crawling on your bellies, and all you have is one little light on your head. I'll take you down a three-hour ad adventure you'll never forget. Longhorn Cavern State Park makes a great day trip. If you're looking to come out into the hill country to explore some of the diverse topographies that we have in the hill country, we're a natural stopping point on any hill country itinerary.
This series is supported in part by Texas Parks and Wildlife Foundation, conserving the wild things and wild places of Texas thanks to members across the state. Additional funding is provided by Toyota. Your local Toyota dealers are proud to support outdoor recreation and conservation in Texas. Toyota, let's go places.